So hello everybody, Friday evening and here we are back with yet another conversation from the trenches. Today we're going to be talking about self-love, relationships and because it's Valentine's Day we are going to really deconstruct both and see how does self-love or loving ourselves unconditionally help us forge more compatible relationships. Now at this point I have a little confession to make. I was just telling Gayatri before I came on that I had this really cool introduction for this topic. And it was, you know, it was as good as any introduction you will find on the mainstream, in the mainstream on the topic of self-love. But it didn't sit right with me. And as I was checking the points in my head, I realized that it wasn't really rolling off my tongue with ease. And when I looked at it and I said, what's wrong here? Why am I not comfortable? I realized that it went against the integrity of who I was as a person. And it went against the integrity of why this whole live conversation exists. Conversations from the trenches are really about the raw, honest conversations from the trenches. It's about the lived experience. It's about the lived wisdom. And when I saw it in that perspective, when I saw self-love and compatible relationships from the perspective of the trenches, I had to ask myself the question, why is this topic so important to me? And why did I feel compelled to have this conversation? with a mental health professional out here in the open and the answer was me myself and i it's about my own journey of learning to love myself it was you know it was rooted in my history of the challenges i've had with relationships a lot of you who have known me who have followed the lives who have followed my journey will know that i've had challenges with self-love and i've had even more challenges forming relationships that were compatible I'm not going to bore you with the details of it. If anybody's interested, please ping me. I will send you the video links to where I've talked about it. But for today and for now, I want everybody who's listening in to know this is a very, very personal conversation. And this conversation is important for me because I am learning about self-love. And because I'm learning and because I'm standing in the trenches as vulnerable as each and everyone who's listening, who will listen to this in the future, Please know that we are all in this together. And with that, I'm going to say, I'm going to welcome Gayatri on. Gayatri, welcome. Thank you so much for joining me today to talk about a topic that is, like I said, so deeply personal and so close to my heart and one which I'm still learning. Um, just a quick introduction about Gayatri. Gayatri is a mental health professional. Uh, she is the founder of Padme, and she has recently started a counseling services, uh, which is consultancy, which is, I'm not sure if I got this right, but I think it's called Kage, right or wrong? Gayatri can correct me. <laughs> yes, uh, it is. yes, it is. Yes, Gayatri it is. is. Gayatri is somebody I've known for quite a while. She's somebody who walks with a lot of grace, a lot of compassion, and a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of heart in wanting to hold space for people and help them heal. So, Gayatri, thank you so much for joining me. Welcome. If there's anything more you want to add and share about yourself with our audience, please, the floor is yours. I welcome you to share a little more about yourself. Thank you so much, Rika. I think that should suffice about me. And thank you for sharing <laughs> about how you started you know, uh, kind of introspecting, right? Okay, what is today all about? I mean, you know, where did this topic come from? <laughs> you know, it's yeah. the trenches, it's the raw emotion that we're going to be talking about. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting, somewhere deep down, it's something that what we experience is something that we like to share. Yeah. And, and if, and it's in a way it's healing as well. And in a way that you're learning through that journey. And then there is someone out there who, probably would take a leaf out of your book in this yes. conversation, right? No, I mean, I may, I... If I may add on, Gayatri, one of the reasons I also realized I wanted to have this conversation was because I realized that loving myself was very deeply connected with my sense of self-worth, my sense of self-esteem, which was not very great. And it was very deeply connected with my mental health and my emotional health. Again, a lot of people know that I have dealt with anxiety. I'm pretty sure in the past I've dealt with depression and I've had symptoms of PTSD. And I do know that a lot of this has, you know, the relationships and the and love has played a very key role in the, 
you know, in my well-being, emotional, mental, and even physical to a large extent mm -hmm. because of my mental well-being. So it's, as you said, something is very personal, but it's also incredibly healing because the more we talk, we realize we are not alone. Uh, I know there are so many women who message me, who ping me and talk about their own challenges with relationships, with love. And I do know this is a conversation that we need to have, but with brutal honesty. So yes. thank you once thank again. You, thank you, Rekha. Thank you, Rekha. Actually, you know what? I, I would even take it a little uh, beyond just women, right? Uh, I would look at it to be gender neutral, you know? Yeah. Because intimacy, relationships, self-love is for, I mean, it's its just not the women. It's for everyone. I agree. And, and to introspect. So I, I guess it, you know, it in, in a way that it's a, a very important part to introspect. Yeah. yeah. And see where you are in the journey, you know, with your self-love. Absolutely. But before we before we kind of go into the self-love aspect, I want to go to the other end of the spectrum, which is relationships, right? Mm -hmm. And the reason I want us to, you know, reverse engineer this whole concept and this conversation is because I think many of us are very rooted in our relationships and we are very mm -hmm. aware of what's going on in our relationships more than what we are aware of where we are at and what's going on. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to start off by asking you, what, according to you, is a secret source of a compatible relationship? I think a seek, the secret source of the uh, compatible relationship always starts with the self, Rekha. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if if you're able to love yourself, um, mm -hmm. in, you know, and see yourself um, unconditionally with everything in it, right? The light, the dark, and all the aspects, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, the good, the not so good, the great, the limiting, mm -hmm. right? Um, and and I think that would help us to actually look at others and mm -hmm. then, uh, and probably, uh, you know, for something to evolve into a more compatible relationship. And what I'm trying to say is that everything starts with the self. The self right? so but you know, if you want to journey with the other, then you need to journey with yourself. Right. But you know, I'm very curious to explore one word, which is compatible, right? Because I find this word compatible being used very often, very frequently. Mm -hmm. And it often seems to me that a lot of people don't, I mean, many of us don't really know what compatible means in a real sense of the thing. Mm -hmm. Like we know the dictionary definition, we know what the word compatible mm -hmm. means, but what really is a compatible relationship between two people? So compatibility, as you said, I mean, is it about liking everything that you like? Or mm -hmm. is taking a different stance and having different perspectives mm -hmm. and liking different things, but yet having to be in a, a compatible relationship or in an intimate relationship. And this is true of anybody. It's just not your yeah. spouse. Or it's just not yeah. your love. Or it's just not your partner. But it is true of any relationship that we are in. Absolutely. You know, I like, I, I, I'm, I've always been very curious about compatibility because there's always this whole concept, particularly in the Asian cultures, where we say, OK, if we are going to form relationships, form relationships with people who are like you. Mm -hmm. And uh, not so much with people, you know, like don't venture beyond what you know, what's the known and the familiar. And I was very curious when you and I spoke about uh, this, this conversation a few days back, you mentioned about differences also being an important part of a relationship, which requires recognition, right? So can I invite you to share a little bit more uh, of your thinking on that? Okay, so when you talk about different aspects of yourselves right mm -hmm. um, and different aspects of the other yeah so in, in a way that you know it also kind of makes it uh interesting and adventurous right i mean if if you were to look at everyone in the same light or have the same yeah mindset or the same kind of you know attitudes or behavior or whatever it may be or likes or dislikes of love of sport or whatever it may be right a hobby or you know perspectives on politics or religion or uh, on love okay and if it's going to be 
you know, polar opposite, then somewhere we think that it is not compatibility. Yeah. yeah. But it's about respecting the differences. Absolutely. Right. And it's okay for the other person to have those, you know, uh, differences that mean and, and the likes or the dislikes that probably you don't hold or the beliefs or the values right. that you may not hold, right? Having right. to see that hmm. is what I think makes it tick. Yeah. Yeah. In a relationship. Okay. While the like minded, it's easy to get along, right? And as you hmm. mentioned, it's very interesting that you said that in our society and in the culture that we live in, it, it's 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 bound to happen. But if you look at India, it's so diverse in its culture and its language and its and its habits and its values yeah. and look at the little communities around you it's so different from yours right and we and we're all able to integrate and live and and uh, you know appreciate and and uh, you know celebrate all the differences right so then so like likewise i think with relationships i think it brings in a certain amount of spark and the unknown you know right right Absolutely. So, you know, uh, this brings me back to, again, the whole concept of love, intimacy and connection. Because love, intimacy and connection are very fundamental to our human existence. So there's, you know, we are not islands. We are connected to each other and we need to see that connection. We need to experience it. And a lot of times, many of us get into relationships. Again, we're not talking about just intimate partner relationships. We're talking about relationships with friends, with people at work, even within our own family, right? Yes. Uh, we, talk, we enter into the relationships with the expectation of being loved in a certain way. My brother should mm -hmm. love me in this way. I want to experience uh, sibling love in a certain way. I want to experience parental love in a certain way. I want to expect experience motherly love or fatherly love. You know, we have different types of love and we want to experience it. And therefore, we enter into relationships with the expectation of experiencing love in a particular way or maybe more than a, one particular way, connection and uh, intimacy, right? But it's also something that people struggle with, particularly when the relationship is long term. Mm -hmm. Right. So why do you think that people struggle in sustaining intimacy or struggle with sustain? Because I often hear the word compromise being used. Relationships are about compromise. You know, mm -hmm. somebody even went to the external telling me relationships are either you compromise or you are lonely. And both mm -hmm. seemed very, you know, and it was said with a sense of resignation. Like, oh my God, what do I do? This is this, it's either this or it's that. And I felt that was a very, it kind of defeated the purpose of getting into relationships, which is for us to thrive, right? So why do you think uh, people struggle in maintaining, forming and maintaining compatible relationships where they can sustain their experience of intimacy or the connection that they desire for themselves? Yeah, so that's really interesting and it's a long question. I and I won't remember the long question, and I'll I'll start with uh, the uh, you know to say that uh, love with conditions and absolutes mm -hmm. would be a hard one to mm -hmm. navigate, mm -hmm. and uh, the one that does not allow space and demanding of love can also become a source of pain. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So loving others unconditionally okay mm -hmm. having of course you know when we start our relationship there is that you know it's like say that you're going on a date for the first time then you're meeting this person and then you're you know you start to you you have that distance in the relationship and that space in the relationship yet yeah. it's quite intimate in the in the first few years yeah and yeah. then what happens to it Mm. There is no separateness or the separation mm. of that whole yeah. unit, right? You become yeah. you become one. You, you become, become one. one. You become Fine. one. Yeah. So the admission is that, that. Yeah. So where is that independent and the self yeah. in in yeah. that relationship of both the partners? And it can be right. a child parent. It can be yeah. um, you know friends. It can be couples it can be yeah. any of these relationships right but right. 
No, I think you're 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 talking more about a relationship with a couple. So just you know, no, staying... I'm, talk, I'm talking about every relationship because yeah. I've heard I've heard this term. Uh, if you love me, you would do this in multiple scenarios. You know, I've heard wives use it with husbands. I've heard parents use it with children. I've you know, so I've seen it in different uh, between friends. I've heard it. So I, I'm not differentiating at this point in time because what I mm -hmm. I it, it, to... the emotional, what I'm hearing is that it's an emotional manipulation or an emotional uh, aspect of it that comes in. Like if you, if you love me, you would do this for me, and that yeah. is emotional manipulation. Right. That is a but, demand. Yeah, right? but a lot of people don't see it as emotional manipulation because there's a set of this is what a relationship is like a mother is supposed to take care of the child yeah. so there are there are expectations that we have built into relationships so how do you take care of the child right i mean i mean yeah. what, there are different aspects or different ways of taking care again here it's also about you know different cultures different yeah. systems in place what what we are hearing through our uh, life what we pick up in the environment right yeah and yeah. that becomes a limiting factor in the relationship of of love and intimacy absolutely yeah you're right and and yes love and connection is fundamental it's important for all human beings yeah, uh, yeah. it's important for all and yeah. it rests on two pillars right love one is surrendering okay yeah. to it yeah. yeah unconditionally but also yeah. having the autonomy to separate yourself from that yeah yeah, you know, uh, when uh, something that strikes one does not and, exist without the other, you need both, right? It's also what you pointed out uh, some time back about the difference between fitting in vis a vis belonging, right? Mm -hmm. Like a lot of times in relationships, you're fitting in to expectations, you're fitting in to what is, you know, what is like, like, let's take a simple example the man is a provider in the family, and that's mm -hmm. a very popularly, firmly held belief in our culture, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of men unconsciously fit into it. They try mm -hmm. to fit into that concept, not, not in, just in their heads, but even in their family structures, right? And there are certain expectations that are, that there are certain standards that women are held to, which they're trying to fit into. And these creep into your relationships with each other whether it's parental, whether it's with siblings, whether it is with, uh, you know, intimate partners in any context, right? Mm -hmm. So for me, it was, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, I hear you. Like you do things to fit in. Would you want to do things to be validated or to fit in and to be acknowledged? Or would you want to belong with the authentic self in that relationship? Right, absolutely. Right? And that's a choice we make, right? It's how we want view. So ultimately, it starts from how we view uh, view ourselves uh, to begin with. And yeah. then if you're going to own your story and if you're going to own yourself with all of those, you know, whatever I said about oneself in, in, in that yeah. deepening that emotions or deepening that aspect of yours of the self, which will have right. everything in it, right? right. Some, right. you know, uh, some aspects which are positive, some as aspects of yourself which is loathsome. Some of them are primitive. But, yeah. you know, but it's, but you bring that authentic self into the relationship. Absolutely. And and a lot of the time, I think people hesitate to do it because people want to fit in. People want to be... Yeah. You know, so there is that, you know, that there is that uh, hesitation to to be different or what. And even if you are different and if you have a different viewpoint or different uh, um, uh, take on things, yeah. Uh, yeah. you kind of just go with the flow because you just want to fit in and, and make peace with the situation. Right. And you compromise. You, so, yeah, you're making a choice. You. You, it's not about compromise. So if you're making the choice, then you got to take responsibility for that. Ah, okay. So I would reframe that in even in any relationship, right? Whether it yes. is in anything. I mean, I would I would rather use the word the choice that we make. 
rather than looking at it as a compromise because then that is limiting yourself in that relationship absolutely but it does take a certain amount of self love awareness and commitment to knowing and working on yourself to even recognize that you're making a choice you're making a choice and the choice may be good bad or ugly but you make the choice and right. and when mistakes happen you take responsibility for the choice that you make absolutely and it's not about you know then when because that's a hard one for people right because it's a choice that you make and then you got to take responsibility for it and then when you make mistakes that's a hard for yeah you know something as you're talking something that comes to my mind is the fact that a lot of times uh, you know people enter into relationships wanting like i said love and connection and intimacy and they're very happy when they get it but somewhere along the way it also becomes about standards and expectations and roles it's not they i think a lot of times people tend to forget that there are two people in that relationship mm -hmm. and there is that act the dynamics between those two people and those two people choosing and if you are aware of that if you are aware and you can focus your mind on the fact that there are two people in that relationship who are making it work and you keep everything else out of it you have a better chance at sustaining or being compatible in the long run what do you think yeah it, it's like this right with it as you said with it's a child and a parent or friends or a couple relationship whatever it's because we're striving to be uh, in perfect relationships yeah and there is pain and hurt in relationships i mean and and you learn to grow together with that pain and and yeah. all of those broken hearts and the loss and most importantly the loss right yeah the loss of it right that is a hard one to to kind of you know to sit with tell us more about loss now in the relationship can you expand a little bit more on that so see any relationship which is painful which is not what you thought it would be or the outcome is is quite different from what you expected then it's it's a loss that you're experiencing in that relationship right ah uh, i hear you and and that loss can be painful yes it can and then you need to sit with that pain yes absolutely and it's it's not an easy one to sit with yes you know i what you say resonates very deeply because i think this is something i mean for me at a very deep level it resonates because uh, this is something i've shared a lot in my life that my dad had an alcoholic problem and therefore there was always a gap between what i wanted my father to be as a child vis-a-vis -vis who he really was as a person and it was well into my adult life because i used to be very angry and i carried that anger and that pain into my adult life it took me quite a while to realize that the anger was symptomatic of the pain and the pain was symptomatic of the loss that i was experiencing mm -hmm. of wanting the father to be uh, you know a father in the way i thought he should have been and the gap between who i wanted him to be as a father the role Oh, you know in his role as a father and who he was as a person so what you say makes a lot of sense um, it's your experience right that's what you you wanted so that's yeah. your loss and yeah. and the loss in that relationship can be it's very unique and different for each person yes what what you have felt a sense of loss in that relationship yeah can be different for someone else who may be viewing it through a different lens of what loss they have experienced in that relationship absolutely yeah absolutely i like the fact that you you highlight the uniqueness of our experiences yes. in very similar seeming uh, situations yes right? yes we all have see you, there could be a like you know i mean just to just say the the take covid for example right the pandemic uh, it's a it's a storm that's yeah. that's blown at all of us right yeah. it's come yeah. to our doorstep yeah but the boat is different the sail is different yeah that and that loss because of the pandemic for some yeah for each and every one it's very uniquely different and the impact of it is different absolutely you're right you're very right and and, and the loss and the grief that you go through 
or people yeah. are going through in the last two years. Yes, it's the pandemic, yeah. which is a generic loss that we're all facing at a humanitarian level. But if you look at it at a granular, at an individual level, it's different. It's played out differently for everyone. Right. So I'm going to now focus our conversation on self-love. Okay, because uh, one of the and okay, so one of the things I noticed about self love was the fact that there's a lot of conversation about self love, mm -hmm. and a lot of conversation I felt from my mm -hmm. lens I felt was focused mm -hmm. on women, and mm -hmm. there seemed to be this whole perception that women don't tend to love themselves holistically, unconditionally, and I'm curious to know what you think about it. Is that something you that you think? Do you think there's merit in that thinking? See, I'm going to just kind of, again, bring it into a very gender neutral perspective, okay, about self-love, okay? It's not about the woman or it's not about the man or it's not about the other gender, okay? It's about people experiencing or understanding what self-love is, right? Uh, I think that the, 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 the thinking or the mindset is, of course, it's nice to cook a wonderful meal for yourself, go for these massages, yeah. take those yeah. selfies. Okay, but in a way that's very limiting, right? I would say yeah. it's a self-limiting belief on self-love itself. Yes. Okay, and self-love is beyond that. It's about self-reliance and self-sufficiency, which means we should be able to look at us ourselves as a flawed individual and still hold ourselves in high regard. That's self-esteem, that is self-care, that is self-love. Yeah, right. So now that you've defined self-love for us, can I invite you to outline self-love as a journey for, for us? Like, what does it mean for a person to live with self-love on a day-to-day -day basis? It's the ability to forgive ourselves when we make our mistakes, fail at things, mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. to look at ourselves as failures. Mm -hmm. Okay. Able to, able to, like you know, uh, say this is enough. To mm -hmm. it's, it's about uh, withstanding the loneliness. Uh, okay. Or, or, uh, in a way, establish that independence and more awareness and acceptance of ourselves in that incompleteness. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And, um, and let other people see that. Yeah. 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 But you know, Gayatri, that's easier said than done. Yes. Like that's yes. one of the reasons why I started off by saying I had a really great speech, but then I had to put it away because I didn't think it maintained the integrity of what I was trying to achieve with these lives. And uh, it's not very easy for us to, uh, you know, to even be aware that we are judging ourselves or we are being harsh to ourselves or we are rejecting parts of us because we are so involved and immersed in living and going through life. Uh, you know, so, so, so what kind of skills and tools do we need to develop those, you know, to build our self-love on a day-to-day -day basis? I think just going, I mean, Really, I mean, this is just, <laughs> you just go with a journey, go through the pain, the disappointments, the hurt, and, 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 and just, just do that. I mean, I, I, I would just say, just go with the flow. I mean, with whatever that comes in, 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 in that journey of self-love. I think the skill is, or the strategy, okay, what, yeah. what stops us from looking at us is okay probably coming in from, you know, the environment where we live and how we live and how we should be living our lives, right? And who is dictating these on what is self-love and how it should be and what it should look like and what form or shape is self-love, right? Okay. Can we make this a little more granular? Because, you know, I love what you're telling me. I love what you're saying because but and i'm speaking like i said this is in my personal experience i he i've heard a lot about self love right i've heard a lot about going with the flow i've heard a lot about uh, accepting parts of me mm. but mm. it's not easy 
right? And like even something as small as I, I, you know, I was in a, I'm in a room full of people and I say something and everybody stares at me and the, my immediate response is, oh, you stupid. Why did you say that? You should have kept quiet, right? I'm just giving an example that unfolds at a day to day, at a very micro level. You cook a dish and somebody says, oh, there's too much salt. You tend to, our automatic response, what I'm talking about is our immediate automatic response of most. There are people who say, too bad you know, what, uh, don't eat or whatever, right? But I'm just saying that our immediate response is, oh, 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 something that I really love. This is an example I really love. Somebody looks at you and say, you put on weight, right? What's the, what's the, what's the, what, you know, and many of us go into a downward spiral because of that one comment, right? So while you can go with the flow, there's also that clinging, and revisiting that suffering over and over again. It's not that, you know, if you were to tell me, hey, you put on weight, right? I wouldn't say, oh my God, that hurts. And then I cry a bit and then I say, I'm going to do something about it. It's not as simple as that. Very likely, a lot of people will wake up every day and say, oh my, she said I was fat. Now, am I fat? Let me go look at it. So you're clinging to that whole suffering of that experience, right? So if we had to look at it at a granular level, while we have conversation about go with the flow, go with all of that, a lot of people are still struggling in really even. So yes. how, how? So from that perspective, yeah. how how can? Uh, yeah, I know. You... I made it very simplistic. No, when I said go with the flow, I didn't get there, or I'm still getting there. I haven't reached there too. But here's what I've learned. Okay. Okay. Um, which I think, I mean, I've taken a leaf out of um, uh, of someone else's uh, writing on self love. Okay, and um, and I and it struck a chord with me. And for the last two, three years, perhaps mm -hmm. that's what I do. So there are there, there are these four five things, right? Can I acknowledge that I messed up without telling myself I'm a mess? Yeah. Yeah. Can I practice regret without falling into the deep abyss? Mm. Mm. Can I take responsibility without blaming myself? That's a choice. Mm. Mm. Can I apologize for a mistake instead of hoping everybody will just move on? Mm. Okay. And mm. then can I acknowledge mm. um, a time that I could have been a better person or a leader in my own life. Yeah. Um, and I should be releasing myself out of uh, from the shame of not having responded sooner to someone when I could have reached out. And yeah. I didn't reach out. I'm just giving these very day-to-day -day examples, okay? Yeah, please, please. I think the more we can get into that, the more relatable it becomes for people and for them to understand I can break a pattern here. So that, that's about it. It's just acknowledging and saying, okay, hmm. it didn't come out too well, probably less yeah. salt. I'll try it out, you know, the next time. That's because right. you're looking at perfectionism in everything that we do. And and it's it's a hard one to keep. Yeah. Yeah. It is. You know, one of the things that I do is what I learned, which, like I said, is a learning curve for me. And one of the things I started learning to do was to say, I put a lot of salt, but I made it. I tried something. I made it. Exactly. And uh, that should count, you know. So it happens that there are going to be times when there's less salt. Yeah. And there are going to be times when there are more salt. And... Uh, it's what it is. That's what the I less salt is easier because you can always add the salt. <laughs> <laughs> and even the more salt in some of the recipes, it are tricks to kind of, you know, <laughs> lessen the salt. <laughs> yeah, but, but, you know, the point I'm trying to make is we take away that whole achievement of having tried something, of having cooked, of having done, that, that whole yes. achievement of having acted. We negate yes. it completely because there's a little more salt, right? And it's all even having to wanting to find fault or wanting to see that there is something wrong in it, right? 
without Absolutely. so you you made you made a dish and it didn't have salt now is right. there a possibility to step back and say okay as you said at least you made it or yeah. you add the salt or find a way to negate the salt in the food yeah or yeah. you know too bad this is what is there at the table right you know it also comes back to the point that when we start appreciating ourselves because a lot of people want to be appreciated they want to be noticed they want to be seen but they're very hesitant about asking for it right and i think you're always sitting on the sidelines waiting and mm -hmm. one of the things i really learned in my journey was to say i want to be seen <laughs> you know <laughs> like please like please like you know send me something nice give me give me a compliment and that was one of the hardest things for me to do it was really one of the hardest things for me to say i've tried and i've done something and i'm very proud of it and i'm very happy and i want to share it with you please be nice say something nice instead but yeah, a lot a of one, Rekha. it is a tough one i mean it's not an easy one right i mean you did something and you want acknowledgement and validation and if you're going to constantly not get that acknowledgement and validation it does bring you down and then it it kind of impacts on on the on the self sufficiency bits and you know the self esteem part of it and then you're you're not enough so i think finding a way to you know uh, to straddle that validation you know yeah. and how much of it yeah uh, too much is not too good too yeah. less is not too good um yeah. and uh, not having it at all is uh, i i it's it is a tough one it's a very tough one to go your in, in life without any validation and any acknowledgement for what you've done right you know that's something that always gets to me because we always talk about oh you shouldn't be looking for validation you know a lot of conversation the positive self talk that they you know that is put out in the mainstream is so much about stand in your power don't wait for people to validate you and for me it defeats the purpose of relationships relating to people because i think the very fact that we are interdependent and that we are wired for connection makes us want validation at some level even in you know, a nomad yeah it's also some sort of a cultural belief no each society and culture the validation is not there because it is it's just done yeah so, i mean what is the reason for you to wanting to be validated because this is something it's par for the course i mean you just get yeah. it done and everyone is doing it right yes okay so here is the tough part i mean so is there a space for you to get that validation or that acknowledgement in your own space with yeah. people that so yeah. again here it becomes you want a uh, thousand insta likes or loves or do you you're okay with four or five <laughs> that are meaningful i'm i'm yeah. just bringing it down to no to no that. I, that's a fantastic example by the way i love that example because you know as a person planning strategies this is a question i get from people all the time how do i get 150 likes right and um, i'm like i i always think why do you want 150 likes because for me you know the whole context of being on social is it makes me happy first and if i get 10 likes from people who who are on my page and my wavelength i'm very happy by it i'm very happy when you know like even if i get zero likes but there's this one person i look up to a thought leader or somebody somebody whose work i admire deeply that person comes and likes my post i will be over the moon even if it's just that one person who's done it and i'm happy with that so i really think you know for me at least what works for me at this point in time in my journey is taking a lot of joy in what i create in you know understanding that it will be imperfect and i can mm -hmm. always go and do better the next time i can edit it i can change it that's also a choice i can make and that also is joy in its you know that whole that's also a joy in itself and then being extra happy having the icing on the cake when others validate it or notice it and give me appreciation or uh, you know or um, their attention yeah so it 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 see in in a sense rika i mean it's a, as much as as humans need that validation and that acknowledgement and all of that 
I think when you build yourself, right? Yeah. Okay. And and you'll reach a point where actually it doesn't matter. Okay. It yeah. may not matter. Okay. Yeah. And and it's not about it's it's not a personal attack on the person. So it's, the person yeah. has to step back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. You know, don't involve the self in such a close context with that. Yeah. yeah. I think also, Gayatri, another thing that, like, at least for me, when I started really working on my, uh, you know, accepting and celebrating the little things that I was doing and not really holding myself to standards uh, that were not my which didn't resonate with me at any level. I think one of the most important things that started happening for me was also my relationship started to change very automatically. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people who were in my life exited very organically. Uh, new new people entered my ecosystem. And I realized that the people who are entering my ecosystem were people who, who very organically gave me the appreciation that I wanted in the mm -hmm. right doses. Mm -hmm. At the same time, would also hold me accountable for, mm -hmm. you know, when I would slip slip up and we could have conversations. So I'm just kind of, uh, you know, what what are you? What are your thoughts on the correlation between our self love journey as it progresses and how that changes the relationships that we are forming? Why do you think that happens? Because there's a change that person sees in you, right? Mm -hmm. And change is not easily acceptable. Yeah. And change is a tough one again. Yes. And, you know, and which means the other person probably once you start changing, then things around you probably will change or may not change. So it, it's, it's really that dynamics that comes into play, right? Because you're evolving, you're changing, while mm. the other person probably is not in that space. Yeah. And they also or don't like the boundaries. Not. They may maybe, also not like the boundaries you start they're not ready for it or maybe they are happy in the space that they are in also not yeah. having to judge anyone right maybe right. they're okay just being in that space right but you've had your experiences and you're evolving and you're changing and that's the pace that you're growing and and hence you you're going to see that but here is what it is can you be in a relationship mm. To accept that the other person hmm. probably is not walking as fast as you you are. Yeah. Or, and having to respect that person in the space that they are in. So tell us a little bit more about that, because that's a very interesting, uh, you know, that's a very interesting uh, scenario you have put out there of two people being in a relationship where they're walking at different paces and if you're ahead or if you're behind how do you accept and create space for that person as you're changing yeah uh, i guess you need to so here is what it is right you got to if you're looking at compatible relationships it's about also looking at accepting the other mm -hmm. and their independent self without having to impinge in their private you know, self space mm. where they may be evolving at their own space or may not be evolving. Yeah. Mm. Right. I mean, uh, I guess that's it's a difficult one, but but if if you want to be respected for for all the changes and for uh, how you're evolving from your partner, yeah. yeah, then likewise you need to treat the same the person with the same respect of where they are in that space yeah you know i think also the important thing is to also recognize when we talk about respect we don't have to understand where the other person is at we don't really yeah. have to understand but we have to respect that person's right to be exactly as they are being and, yes. and i think the only point where i would flex that is when there's abuse involved but that's when i say okay that's the boundary you have to draw for yourself and not accept. But uh, it's really about saying, okay, I don't get it, but it's important to you, so so be it. Because so I'm be. claiming that same freedom for myself. Yeah, yeah. So it's like this, right? If you treat yourself with compassion, yeah, respect will lead 
others to do the same to you or treat the same way that you treat them, right? Well, sometimes. I think I think it again depends on the cultural dynamics, the social dynamics. Yes, and all yes. That. I think it's all of that. This right? is very broad, okay? I mean, if yeah. we have to bring it down to specifics, then really, I mean, it is very dynamic, right? Yeah. No, in, terms trying... of, in terms of the culture, in terms of our belief systems and in, in the way that we've we've formed certain uh, limiting beliefs of self-love or what is expected out of the partner, how the partner is expected to treat us or to to go with us, yeah. right? In, yeah. I mean, these are there, out there, and then we try to emulate it. And when we try and emulate it is where the struggle is, because each one is unique in their own in their own pace and growing at their own pace. I think one of the most critical things for any human being, again, being gender neutral, being very human being, is being very aware of what works for you mm. and what are the non-negotiables for you at a human level. Yes. And then saying, okay, these are non-negotiable. I will not, this, I'm not going to dial back on this and artic and more than anything else, articulate it and communicate it. Because I think that, you know, being able to articulate it rather than wait for people to read your mind or guess at it is also yeah. a very important aspect of self-love and a key element of a compatible relationship, right? Yes, yes, yes. See, the thing about... The idea of selfhood is not new, okay? It's there yeah. in all cultures. Yeah. Right. And yeah. it is very unique um, uh, or varied. It's separate. Sometimes it's together. It's independent or it's a conformist. It is, it's there, but, you know, but the idea of self is also evolving with, 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 with uh, the culture yeah. and the uh, changes that we see in society, right? If yeah. you look at if you look at the West now, the they tend to see the self as a separate entity with very clear boundaries hmm. that which de de alienates the independent identity, right? Right. Yep. And 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 so this vision of the self for them is comprised with all those you know, ruminations about disappointments or love or yeah. anger yeah. or, you know, frustrations yeah. or, you know, confidence or joy, pain, whatever it may be. Okay. Right. And it's all about these connections with it. Right. So, mm. and so if you look at it, every culture will have its own, you know, unique. Yeah. Um, so again, we can't compare. Yeah. Again, we can't do that because cell food is, firstly, it's not something new. It's not like it's it's only, you know, in the last decade or two that we've hearing about it, but it's there. It's been there for eons. Right. right. Okay. So uh, just as we are coming to almost, we're almost up, an hour is up and we're just getting to the, you know, getting to the end of it. Just a quick, uh, you know, just a quick question that I have for you. What what advice or suggestions do you have to offer for people to set to start or to set a regimen for self love on a daily basis, particularly in the context of their relationships? Like, how do you love yourself and uphold yourself and the needs of yourself, the non negotiable needs of yourself in the context of relationships where there are push and pull and dynamics and whatnot. Yeah, so I don't have any advice or recommendations, but what, what I would, because again, it's unique to each person, right? What I, but the, what I seemingly think works is just putting down your thoughts. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Your everyday journaling really helps. Okay. Mm. Because then you, and journal all the dark and the side and the good the bad the ugly yeah. the whatever it is all your experiences okay yeah hmm. and look at look at it from choices that you make rather than a compromise that you're making you have a choice yeah to exit if you want to yeah yeah 
Okay, so yeah. look at all of that in a in a very in a in a way that you. I mean, it it's 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 more of introspection, no, Rekha. I mean, at this point, I mean, really, and and the choices that one makes may be looking like a compromise to the other. Okay, but that's their choice, and it's how you view it. Okay. And I think just evolving, right? Yeah. Separately and coming together. So you know, this is a very beautiful one that um, I, I, I would, I would like to, you know, share this. Um, uh, you know, um, I'm, I'm not able to uh, just get it in my head, but this is Khalil Gibran's thing on, on uh, love and intimacy. Okay. And he talks about how you know it 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 the, you have to give space for couples or any yeah. relationship. Yeah, even children. Even Khalil Gibran talks about children also it's, it's, as being yeah. borrowed from time. And I think it's the most satisfying relationships, according to him, are between two people um, who've made spaces in their togetherness. So. Yeah. While you're together, how do you make those spaces? Right, right. You know, what I really like about what you pointed out as an everyday practice is for us to reflect to in a very brutally honest way and look at how we have gone through our day, how we have gone through our incidents, and also look at it in the context of choices. Because a lot of times when we think about compromises or we think about uh, expectations or when we tell somebody, if you love me, you would do this. Or as my mother, or as my father, or as my you know, as my brother, as my husband, or as my child, I you are supposed to be doing this. If we recognize choice, all of these as choices we are making, and we also recognize that the other person has choices to exercise in the way they live their life, I think a lot of us would not only have more compatible relationships, we not only create space for each other in our relationships, but we also evolve into more loving versions of ourselves, where the love starts with us for us and then is radiating outside. Yes. Right? Yeah, basically own your story. Own your story, walk in your story, live your mm -hmm. story. Yeah. yeah, own your, your story. <laughs> and, and every day your story may look different and that's okay. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. There's no right or wrong that there's just a journey. There is no right or wrong to anyone's yeah. story. It's the choices yeah, and, that you make. Yeah, I think the minute you recognize that every moment you're making a choice, that's the game changer. Because then that's you really... Yeah. 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 Because the longest time, you know, I mean, before I even moved into the space of, uh, of introspection and, you know, healing and getting into the mental health space, I've, it was compromised, right? It yeah. shifted for me over a period of time. In the last, I think, probably 10 years, it shifted. Yeah. yeah. And it's now it's even stronger because it's a choice. Absolutely. Absolutely. I choose to do it. And when I choose something and I do something and I make a choice, whether it is my livelihood or whether it's my relationship with my uh, partner or whether it's a relationship with my child, I'm making these choices. And if I make those mistakes, then I own the... Mistake. I take responsibility for it. Mistake so there is no outing. There, yeah. there is no uh, opting out, right? There is, yeah. There's no pop out there. That's it. It's, it's you. And that's I, a hard one, Rekha. No, it is. It really is. But I think the minute you start realizing everything is a choice, even from the food you eat or, you know, everything is a choice, the minute you realize that, then you can really start asking yourself, does this choice work for me or not? Do I want to, you know, is it negotiable? Is it non-negotiable? See, then the, that choice opens out a whole spectrum by itself to tick off and for you to evaluate. So I think that's fantastic. But anyway, It's about the bad food, which I discussed earlier, the, the, the choice <laughs> that I have to take. All right, <laughs> I take respons the responsibility for it. <laughs> good for you guys, good for you. 
but anyway, we are almost uh, we are we are almost close to an hour, and I think it's uh, time for us to wind this down. Uh, this has been a great conversation. I can see quite a few people have been weaving in and out, and everyone has been silent. But I really, really hope this has been insightful for all of you. I really hope there have been takeaways for everyone. And I want to thank you very much for joining us this evening. Gayatri, thank you so much for joining us. I know you've been a little unwell, and I'm very grateful that you have joined us despite feeling poorly. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Rekha. I mean, um, I would, uh, yeah, it is made a choice <laughs> to, to be here. And thank, and, uh, thank you so much for inviting me every few months and having me to share my perspectives. <laughs>